No, I think the thing that sets human beings apart from other creatures is a built-in dissatisfaction. There's an itch that we have that can't be scratched. Our efforts to scratch it have created civilization, which is essentially the practice of trying to adapt the environment to us rather than adapting ourselves to the environment. decided long ago that we were terrified by nature and that we needed to be more powerful so that we weren't threatened by nature so much. The flight to land and the first men on the moon. Technology means power to us. It symbolizes potentially immortality. This is the fantasy that somehow we can transcend our horrible condition of being human through these shiny black boxes. You become a god. You have the power to change reality. You have the power to create reality. When you look on the TV, and is anything you see real? Nobody knows anymore. With the, the, some of the digital imagery, with some of the retouching, some of the 3D animation, what you see, it's, it's, it isn't real. And with this technology, it lets me be a god, and it lets me create my reality. Right for the mind, Mac. Karina! I hear about we like the idea of a controlled environment only because you can control whether there's pollution, you can control what's in the ocean, control what's on the sand, the beach. It's just a cleaner environment. They've had a lot of experience to change things. In a sense, tourism begins as a kind of controlled environment. Middle class people could now travel and see the world. It used to be that going to exotic places required a certain hardiness of spirit, and now it was a more controlled experience, less random, with guides to take you. And now that's been brought home. I mean, you don't have to go to the pyramids anymore. The pyramids can come to you. You know, uh, I've worked so hard all the week. At Epcot Center at Disney World or in Las Vegas, you can see reproductions of all those things, and they're they're ever so much nicer than what you can see in, in the real world. You can have a nice sort of dinner in, in a Mexican pyramid and watch the volcano explode at just the right time. And, you know, you're guaranteed of having the experience that you were expecting. Seems to me that now what we have is the capacity to literally create the environment that we want to be in. That is to make available environments that would not be normally available to most people. I mean, it's an extension of something like a, a shopping mall or something like the Metrodome.
people who are most offended by the results of mechanistic technology are also the ones who most vehemently oppose biotechnology and nanotechnology, which are really the options, uh, which are really nature-based technologies. You know, we are moving from the industrial model to the biological model. Well, there are individuals who think that cyberspace is unnatural and that computers in some sense are artificial. But you have to realize that our brain is in some sense a tremendous computer. And it may take many centuries before we have true robots that can simulate the functions of the brain. But there is a continuum. get to the point where we can simulate a person and their reaction so well because we'll understand the chemical, the formulation of the body and all that so well that maybe we will have computers that are basically people. The reason why we don't have mechanical butlers and mechanical maids, the reason is pattern recognition. Computers can see, but they don't recognize. They don't understand. I don't think robots are going to replace human beings. I think what we're going to see is more of a merger of human beings and robots to become some kind of combined organism. In the next few years, we're going to start seeing household robots appear. And they have to be fairly sophisticated. They have to be able to move around a house without bumping into things and knocking things over. And they have to learn their surroundings. So we're going to see a spectrum from very stupid to very smart. I definitely think that artificial intelligence is it's already starting. Artificial. It's already happening. Yeah. And it will take over. It definitely will take over. And I don't think that man is really ready to accept that. Now that you're transferring human consciousness from the brain to a machine of some kind, it puzzles many people because they tend to think of themselves, because of religious ideas, as essentially a soul. They think there's some non-physical spiritual matter inside this human body. And so if you talk about transferring personality from the brain to a computer, they, they don't see how that's possible. The brain is a combination, unless you're a deeply religious person and you believe that the spirit is something other than the, the human existence is biology, chemistry, and electronics combined in a very unique way. The brain is a finite system of neurons. Once you figure it out, once you got a template for it, it's just a question of running the map. Piece of cake. Obviously, in a human life, there's too much information to fully assimilate, but you can make a good, educated guess. That's what artificial life's all about, too. A good, educated guess. So, can we download our personalities? Yeah, maybe. Uploading them is a different story, though. Downloading them? I think so. We'll get there eventually. Right now, we're not in very good control of our impulses. We tend to get angry and envious and jealous and have wars all the time. We made some changes to our genetics and our neurochemistry. We might better control those things. And we're beginning to see just the bare beginnings of that and some of the, the chemicals people are using. Like Prozac is a very crude example, of something which moderates personality. But I think we'll see far more sophisticated chemical control of our brains, which we can choose ourselves as individuals and choose who we want to be. At the edge of our culture, people are starting to view drugs as information. You take a particular combination of chemicals to create a particular response in your brain and your nervous system. 
and uh, you find that response perhaps useful in, in getting a different view of reality. These people no longer feel constrained by the social rules of the past. If you take ecstasy, it takes your ego away, so you, you have a better time relating with people and understanding what people have to like say or do. Like even if it's just for a little while, that experience can change like your whole life. The first time I took ecstasy, I saw people in a whole different light. I saw them like all as good, and like everybody else was on ecstasy too, so they were all good. I like um, like optical optical like um, machines that sort of like um, tap into the the visual cortex and sort of like stimulate your brain. It's like your mind all the time, you just, it's like, it plays, you know, just what you see, you exaggerate. Everything you, you see is exaggerated. Chocolate, a lot of chocolate, sugar, white, synthetic sugar. MDMA ecstasy. key to a human psychology is to know how to operate your brain and that means to be able to expand consciousness and in the past they the psychiatrists and the ministers and priests that were either sane or you're crazy and throughout human history they the controllers that want to scare us there's sanity and what's real and that's what we're in charge of and anything else is sinful psychotic evil daft, hallucinatory. And the mind itself becomes a controlled environment as we move in and begin to understand it more and map it. This terrain becomes something we can handle. You're watching Sleepcore, media for insomnia. This is an emergency meeting of all departmental heads of the XYZ Furniture Company. That's Mr. Armstrong, the president. He called the meeting to discuss the loss of a $75,000 order. This has been one of several large orders lost in the last few months. According to Mr. Johnson, sales manager, it was production's fault. 
But according to the production manager, Mr. Smith, his department was not at fault. Let's take time out and analyze why this order was lost. February 1st, the $75,000 order for Futura chairs was signed at the customer store for delivery before March 15th in time for their annual spring sale. February 4th, the order was mailed to the plant. February 6th, it was received at the plant. February 8th, the order went through a credit check where there was a two-day delay because of the amount of small orders being checked. February 13th, the order was typed in the sales department. A couple of new girls were being trained on the job, uh, thus causing another delay. February 14th, the order was checked for accuracy by another girl. A mistake was found and it had to go back. More lost time. February 15th, the order was received at production control. February 18th, a clerk checked the inventory status of Futura chairs. He found there was not enough in stock to fill the order. February 19th, the order was passed on to the production scheduling group to determine how soon the necessary chairs could be built. By February 20th, the production schedule had been analyzed. It was found necessary to revise all production plans in order to meet the March 15th delivery date. February 21st, based on this new plan, the supply of raw materials was checked. Not enough in stock to even begin filling the order. More raw materials had to be obtained. February 22nd, the order for raw materials was typed, verified, and signed. This was done more rapidly than usual because now they realized they were in trouble. From February 22nd to March 4th, they waited for the raw materials. Meanwhile, preparations were made so production could begin as soon as the materials arrived. March 5th, the raw materials arrived and production began. March 19th, production completed. March 21st, the furniture was finally ready for shipment, but it was six days too late for the customer's spring sale. Order canceled. So the furniture went to the warehouse instead. The bottleneck was paperwork. Actual production took only 16 days but it took 28 days of paperwork and delay before production could even start. However, the problem did not end there. According to the chief accountant, the profit and loss statement for February showed that they had built up their warehouse inventory of colonial style furniture to $150,000. This style was not selling as well as predicted, so they had to cut the price to 120,000 to get rid of it. This meant a loss of $30,000. To make matters worse, still more Colonial was in production. By this time, everyone was well aware of the problem. But what was the solution? How could management control be improved? Hire a hundred more clerks? No. There's a more practical solution. Industry has a powerful new tool for handling paperwork operations and for improving management control. Electronic data processing. Electronic data processing. Genie of business. Almost like a story out of the Arabian Nights, Electronic data processing has suddenly appeared as a new helper for the businessman. A machine with many of the characteristics of the human mind, it follows management's instructions exactly. This is not tomorrow's dream. It is equipment ready and available for use today. There are electronic machines available in many price ranges, including large equipment, medium-sized equipment, and even small equipment 
that can be applied to numerous computation problems in business. What are the major characteristics of this new management tool? First, and perhaps most significant, is the computer's ability to carry out a long series of operations without human intervention. To accomplish this, the machine has stored inside it all of the different procedural steps that it must follow. When there are several alternative procedures that might be used in a given case, the machine automatically selects the right procedure and follows it. All of these procedures can involve many thousand individual instruction steps. The second major characteristic is that of memory. The machine has two basic types of memory. One being a large volume type of memory for storing the files of the business. The other is a small volume, high speed memory where all of the procedural steps are retained. To illustrate the large volume memory, a life insurance company might have several hundred thousand active insurance policies. All of the information on all of these policies can be retained on tapes such as these and the machine could search automatically for a desired policy record. The third major characteristic of these machines is speed combined with accuracy. Instructions and data stored on this rotating magnetic drum can be selected by the machine in a few thousandths of a second or can be selected from these magnetic cores in a few millionths of a second. Reports for management can be printed out at fantastic speeds also. This printer can print up to 10 lines per second. From the teletype or from typist, information on punched paper can be fed directly into the computer. In watching an electronic data processing system in operation, you are struck by how few people are involved. This impression is misleading. There are more people behind the scenes than first meets the eye. In fact, the real challenge for electronic data processing is getting properly trained people. There is an urgent need for systems engineers who lay out the broad procedures under which the system will work. Then there is the need for skilled programmers and coders who write the detailed procedures for the machine. A new type of machine operator is needed who understands the operation of the machine and can get the work out on time. Tape librarian and tape changers who make sure that the file tapes are properly identified. And accurate data recorders who enter the information into the system. Eventually, we will see the work of the automation engineer, where the computer will directly instruct the machine tools in the production shop as to what parts to make and how many to make. The machines are here. Automation of the office can be a reality. Electronic data processing is truly a genie which can improve the competitive position of a firm, and it is here now. To understand how these systems can benefit management, let's see how they operate. First, input. As a sales order is typed, the same information is punched on a paper tape and then transferred to magnetic tapes. One full typewritten order is stored on about one inch of tape. The magnetic tape then becomes the file of the sales orders arranged alphabetically by customer name. All information ordinarily contained in several filing cabinets can now be stored on one reel of tape for faster reference. Next, processing. The electronic system includes a computer which performs functions such as checking, posting, analyzing, scheduling, summarizing, statistics, inventories, and so on. These processes reduce the mass of input data to the key information necessary for effective management. This one system operates faster and more efficiently than innumerable clerks. A high-speed printer translates this information in machine language into written human language, such as credit reports, shop orders, inventory reports, accounting reports, and so on. But computers will do more than clerical work. They can present to management essential data for more efficient control. For example, suppose the electronic system predicts not enough in stock for anticipated orders. Management is notified and can take action. 
Suppose actual sales are greater than predicted sales. The high-speed electronic system would detect such a trend immediately and would automatically compute a revised sales forecast. This allows management to adjust production to avoid bottlenecks. All this takes place at a speed impossible for any number of clerks. And now back to the XYZ company. How would this speed, accuracy, and greater control have saved their $75,000 order? First, sales orders would be typed and the paper tape punched at the numerous XYZ sales offices throughout the country. The tape would be airmailed or fed into a teletype line. The customer file tape unit would spin to locate the customer's record. And the processing dean would check his credit rating. If found satisfactory, the processing machine would go to the second tape unit, the furniture inventory file. The system would check the inventory level of Futura chairs. If there were enough, it would automatically order shipment from the warehouse. However, if the inventory were too low, as happened with Futura, it could notify management immediately. Management could then take action and use the electronic system to schedule the necessary production. Raw material supply would be checked automatically. If there were not enough raw materials in stock to build the required chairs, the machine would print out a purchase order. With the issuing of this order, the paperwork would be completed. This speed and efficiency would have saved 20 days for the XYZ company. The production deadline could have been met and the $75,000 order would have been saved. But the advantages of electronic systems go far beyond this for XYZ, in fact, for everybody. For example, the consumer will pay lower prices. The customer will be assured of earlier deliveries. The salesman will have better customer relations. The employees will be engaged in more supervisory work and a less monotonous routine. The controller will always have up-to-the-minute financial reports. The department heads will have fewer crises. And the stockholders will have less of their investment tied up in inventory. Management will benefit most directly. The electronic system will provide all necessary data in time for effective forecast and control. Come back again 
I sit on the stairs, just counting the stars, telling them I love you.
don't count the summer breeze and the trees don't count when you're counting the stars alone and lovers lane that shady lane somehow it seems to be there in vain when you're counting the stars alone i find all night a love night to others i see to them the stars are love night but they're just stars to me the good old moon its beams don't count you dream and dream but your dreams don't count when you're counting the stars alone You're watching Sleepcore, Pleasant Dreams. Quand 
contact. Peut-être. Essuie-glace. Fa. Diagnostic. Niveau correct. Pression des lignes satisfaisante. Autonomie. 350 km à 90 km h Pas de nécessité d'une révision vidange avant 2700 km. Radio. Film musique. Plus fort. Moteur chauffe, arrêt moteur impératif. Pas de remise en route du moteur avant diagnostic. Clignotant. Détresse. Essuie-glace. Rapide. Intermittent. Dégivrage. Terminé. d'informations, je peux répondre à toutes les questions et délivrer un diagnostic immédiat de l'état du véhicule. Niveau correct. Les fonctions sous contrôle ne présentent pas de défaut. Je vous fais les niveaux aussi Non, non, merci, tout est OK. Bon. Tenez. Merci. Et oui, je saurai demain obéir fidèlement Contact. à la seule voix de mes maîtres. Moteur. Radio. 
Radar Anticollision. Radar en action. Votre position Saint-Jean-de-Sixte. Votre destination Cochevel. Itinéraire choisi Numéro 3.
You're watching Sleepcore. Pleasant dreams. For more than two decades, Sybaris Pool Suites have proven to be the perfect place for couples searching to get away. A paradise for couples seeking to ignite their feelings, rekindle their romance, and enjoy quality time together. A Sybaris Pool Suite is a delight to the senses, providing every amenity possible. It's the ultimate romantic experience. Let's begin your romantic adventure together with this sneak preview of Sybaris Pool Suites. Luxurious. Romantic. Relaxing. Mm. I made him laugh. Fun. Yes. I made Fun. him laugh. <laughs> I was counting the times so I was making him laugh. It's just the two of you, together, alone, in a Sybaris Pool Suite. The perfect marriage of soothing water and comforting fire. A luxurious environment which brings couples closer together. I think it's real hard for, for people to get time alone um, because there's always something else going on. Yeah, it was nice that you didn't have to worry about the phone, the doorbell, the kids, but we've never had the luxury to just lay there and talk to each other, you know? And I think it was three in the morning before I realized it's three in the morning, you know? We just got deep in talk and relaxing and having a good time. Everybody wants to be held and cared for and touched and loved, everybody. For 20 years now, Sybaris founder Ken Knutson has witnessed what his dream has meant for thousands of couples. It allows people to open up and talk and they can't do that at home. The triggers, the triggers of home life keep you from doing that. And the communication is priceless. It's that time that you can talk and share and say how you feel. That's what Sybaris brings out of you. Sometimes when you have children, it tends to make the relationship sway away, you know? And this is, the Sybaris is more like an opportunity to make things back romantic and just bring things a lot closer together, you know, as far as your relationship is concerned. It can do a lot for one night. One night can do a lot for a person that hasn't been alone in a long time, and that's our problem. Oh, it's a place for rejuvenation of a relationship. It's a place to perpetuate, maintain that feeling that you desperately want. Sybaris Pool Suites. From the elegance of the Whirlpool Suite to the extravagance of the chalet, it's a tropical getaway that's close to home. As soon as we walked in, our eyes just uh, widened and our, our mouths just dropped. They had the lighting just right. All the lights were dim. The fireplace was, was on. And it was just very romantic. I mean, it was just beautiful. And someone really thought about every little detail, you know, towels by the pool, towels by the whirlpool, towels by the jacuzzi, towels in the sauna. Um, robes, robes on the bed. Terry cloth robes, it was like, let's just Even a corkscrew by the... Uh, uh, glasses? Glasses. Nice bucket, yep. Someone nice thought box. of every detail. But it was just, you didn't have to worry about creating the atmosphere to have a nice one-on-one -on -one conversation, you know? You didn't have to worry about soft music or, you know, candles or anything. It was like, everything else was taken care of, of for you, you just had to worry about each other. It's really a class place. I mean, it, it, this guy who came up with this idea, I, I think he thought about the everyday guy who wanted to get away and just enjoy himself, even if it was nothing for it but a day or two. When you walk into a Sybris room, the room is so opulent, a blue water shimmering with lights fractured through it, off the ceiling, a fireplace flickering, soft lights under the bed, soft music, the room smells beautiful, palm trees, a Hawaiian sunset in the room. Every trigger there tells you pleasure, tranquility, a remote island, you've shut out the world. Wow. You know, he's like going, a, I wow. want a room like this at this home. Is, if, you know, if you Can ever I build home, this at home? If you ever build a <laughs> home, this is like the kind of master bedroom we've got to have. I mean, I was amazed. Here's a place that you don't come in and just get some rinky-dink cassette player. They give you a stereo system. CD. 
CD. I brought my CDs because, you know, I love jazz. I, I mean, you get the movies, you get, I mean, <laughs> this is, where is this guy Ken at again? I want to shake his head for coming up with this concept because now I have a way to <laughs> I got a way to deal with all that stuff. Silver's move. <laughs> That's a, a result of 20 years. 20 years of evolution. And only the wealthy seem to have the opportunity, like lifestyles are rich and famous. And you look at these things, no one that I know has a bedroom with a swimming pool in it. Not even the richest of people. It is your own swimming pool. It's not like shared with everybody else. This is your own. Um, Total luxury. People think that the pool is a small, like little, little pond pool. This is a, it's a, it's a, bit, it's a lake. This, <laughs> this pool is a lake. The sparkling waters of a Sybaris pool suite, continuously tested 24 hours a day, with state-of-the-art diagnostic systems that monitor and balance the pool. And as I was lounging by the pool and just relaxing, drinking my wine, you know, it's like the rich people appreciate that they could do this any day of the week you know it's like we're really lucky you know to just get away have each other it was relaxing it was getting acquainted I think it was it was immaculate yeah it was impeccable the, it, the room was just spotless everything words like immaculate and impeccable describe the care and attention our suites receive our suites are meticulously cleaned and detailed, and each suite receives a thorough top-to-bottom final inspection. First time we stayed in the uh, regular swimming pool suite. Yeah, and then we had the one with the world. We had the, then we had the deluxe the yeah. second time. And the next time, I think we're going for the shot lake so I can pull them up, Fuck explore right up into the garage, <laughs> and I can get out of bed, slide right down into the pool. <laughs> I don't care what anybody says. That's worth it if you want to be able to do it but just one time a year. It really is. Sybaris Pool Suites, a dream two decades in the making. Four convenient locations today, but it all started 20 years ago in Downers Grove. We currently have uh, two swimming pool suites at the very entrance, the beginning. And then it has a, a series of whirlpool suites. There's eight whirlpool suites, private individual cottages. Then it has three deluxe Whirlpool Suites and one top-of-the-line, one-of-a-kind deluxe swimming pool suite, of which it's a two-story swimming pool suite where the bedroom is cantilevered over the pool and the, the waterfall cascades down in front of the Whirlpool that's up on the upper loft and it's a very special room. Northbrook is probably the most deceiving because the entrance is only 100 feet wide, but it opens up into a thousand foot run of five acres in the back and that's secluded in the forest preserve. Just gorgeous. So as soon as you check in, you'll go through a guard gate, little entrance, and then you'll go winding through the forest preserve and the trees surround the entire property. It's a magnificent. On the Northbrook property, each building is its own separate cottage, and it makes a little special touch out there. The Mequon property is probably one of the most beautiful properties that we have. It has a 300-foot entrance, and down the entrance on either side are lanterns. To the left is a magnificent farmhouse, an old country farmhouse that was built in 1869. In 1909, it was converted into a restaurant. Since 1909, Wolf's Island Restaurant has been known as the place to go for an intimate dinner, cocktails and dining, the best food that you could have. In every single square inch of the property, you can feel the history and enjoy the warmth. The restaurant is a perfect complement for your stay at Sybaris. You'd want to have room service delivered to give you the privacy, or you may want to take a short stroll across the yard and dine in the gazebo or in one of the beautiful dining rooms to have a cocktail and dinner over candlelight. Just perfect for a getaway. And then to the right of that is the country-styled motel rooms. 
Each room is antique style, mansion beds, armoires. Uh, the Whirlpool for two is surrounded by lace. The bedroom has a large picture window that goes out onto a private deck. And then you have a Dutch double door, so you can have a door in the front, a door in the back, and the wind blows through the room. It's just a magnificent room. Out on the deck, you have a Weber grill. And then in the courtyard is a gazebo, a pond, and a trail that you can walk through the property on. Then surrounding that particular piece, we have the swimming pool suites, where we have the deluxe whirlpool, the swimming pool, deluxe swimming pool, and the chalets. Frankfurt Sybris is also built around a 100-year-old farmhouse. It is magnificent. And you come in the same as you would to the uh, Mequon property, and at the very front is this 100-year-old farmhouse that we completely rehabbed, and that serves as the office check-in area. The swimming pool suites surround this farmhouse, and it's magnificent. It's all done the outside like an antique uh, lap-sided to match the farmhouse, all done in white and black. Just beautiful. Sybaris Pool Suites, romantic, luxurious, and affordable. What's it cost to get on a plane and fly down to Florida somewhere? It costs you, first you gotta get on a plane, you gotta worry about luggage, you gotta worry about travel arrangements, you gotta worry about this and that. I mean, this Sybaris concept to me is, is so amazing because it gives you a vacation without leaving anywhere. I think it's a perfect anniversary present for each other or something you know, just to spend on each other, a little splurge every once in a while. I think it's very affordable. Uh, we're thinking of giving our parents a gift certificate there, definitely. They deserve to get away too. I can't think of any place locally where you could get so much for really so little. I mean, it's, it's not cheap per se, but I think like on an annual basis, like if you take a vacation or a weekend out of town, it kind of fits that bill and it's got so much to offer once you get there. But I think it was instant relaxation. And the number one question that everyone asks, is it worth the money? I didn't hesitate, I'm like, absolutely. You know, and we're not made of money. Teacher, Catholic, Catholic school, school teacher, teacher, I might add. <laughs> and, but absolutely. And we were talking, I said, we have to go back for our next anniversary, we just have to do it. At each Sybaris location, our front desk staff is committed to your complete satisfaction. At the front desk, ask about our gift certificates for your next special occasion. Also available at the front desk, a wide selection of videos for your viewing pleasure, from nature's landscapes to relationships and intimacy. You hear a lot about uh, the Sybaris, but it's more than what I, what I imagined it would be. Oh yeah, we left out of here like we are dating again. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly how we, yeah. you know, cloud nine. It's like a tropical paradise, really, it is. You gotta try it. I mean, you just got to try it. You gotta experience it. And now choose from an array of romantic gifts from Sybaris' own gift catalog. Gifts you can order to be delivered to your home or have placed in your suite prior to your staying with us. Featuring unique gifts like this exquisite live red rose sealed in 24 karat gold. Or these soft terry cloth robes and lounging bath wraps. Treat your loved one to a romantic massage utilizing luxurious scented body oils and lotions. Order fresh flowers to be delivered anywhere in the continental United States. Get your free catalog today by calling 630-543-9900. You can also visit us on the internet at www.sybaris.com. 
Beautiful gifts that enhance romance and intimacy just for the two of you.
You're watching Sleepcore, media for insomnia.
Второй номер. 
оборонные частушки в исполнении жен красноармейцев. week's Westinghouse program, here is something well worth remembering. Now that the world has learned how to tap atomic energy with the atomic bomb, what a blessing it would be if science could harness this vast atomic energy to generate electricity, to propel ships, to do the work of the world. Well, it's on the way. Here at Westinghouse, as men write another chapter in the sureness behind every Westinghouse product, scientists are developing the world's first atomic power plant for ship propulsion. Entrusted by the Navy and the Atomic Energy Commission, Westinghouse men are converting basic data from the University of Chicago into the atomic power plant. So once more, Westinghouse Engineering and Research chart the path of the future. If it's a product for home, for business, for farm or factory, you can be sure if it's Westinghouse. In a nuclear attack on this country, one of the greatest threats would be radioactive fallout. While heat and blast effects of even the largest bombs would have a definite limit, any area could be threatened by fallout. The large number of weapons which probably would be dropped in a full-scale attack would produce fallout, ranging from light to intense over much of the nation. Weapons exploded close to the earth cause greatest fallout hazards. Thousands of tons of earth particles are drawn upward into the ascending mushroom cloud where radioactive products of the nuclear explosion contaminate them. These particles are carried by the high altitude winds for many miles. Eventually they settle to earth and this is called radioactive fallout. We are all subjected to radiation from outer space and from radioactive material of the Earth's crust. We're exposed to it when the doctor x-rays us and on many other occasions. Radiation in small or controlled amounts like that are not dangerous. But in large amounts, the amounts produced by nuclear explosions, radiation can make you seriously ill or even kill you. Radiation produced by nuclear weapons presents a revolutionary threat to our country. In an enemy attack, it could become a direct threat to us all. Fortunately, there are means of protecting ourselves, means so effective that civil defense officials believe everyone can survive fallout if they take a few simple precautions to protect themselves. The biggest danger from fallout is the fact that the particles do not have to touch you to endanger you. Their deadly rays can penetrate any kind of material, but the material through which they pass absorbs part of the radiation and reduces the hazard. Your safety depends upon putting a sufficient mass between yourself and the fallout. Concrete, bricks, earth, or sand are the best, but in a pinch, any heavy material will do. Civil defense officials recommend that everyone prepare a shelter. In most areas of the country, 
you would receive ample protection in a basement shelter constructed of eight inch concrete walls. This provides the same shielding as 12 inches of earth, 16 inches of books, or 30 inches of wood. To be certain of adequate protection, however, the shielding should be that equivalent of three feet of earth. Civil defense officials recommend that for the best fallout protection, your family have these two things, an approved fallout shelter and enough supplies to enable you to stay in it for a maximum of two weeks. Within that two week period, it is estimated that community resources will have been restored to give you some help. A short time later, assistance should be available from the state and federal governments. Get started right away at protecting your family from fallout. Plans for approved shelters are available from your civil defense officials. Some of the shelters you can build yourself. The more elaborate models can be undertaken by a contractor. Let us look at five shelters developed by the Office of Civil and Defense Mobilization, any one of which will provide good fallout protection for your family. First, the basement concrete block shelter is specifically designed as a do-it-yourself project. The cost will vary according to your area, but should range between $150 and $200 for materials. It would provide all the protection needed in most areas. You must be sure the shelter has the proper doorway, air vents, and ceiling beams capable of holding two layers of concrete blocks. Plans for this shelter can be incorporated easily into new home construction. In all of these shelters, incidentally, you must be sure to use solid concrete blocks rather than the hollow variety. The hollow kind will not give adequate shielding unless they are filled with cement, sand, or earth. The second recommended shelter is the above ground double wall shelter. It is an outdoor above ground construction which also may be built with concrete blocks. It is ideal for regions where water or rocks make it impractical to build underground. Most people would want to hire a contractor to build it. Materials would cost about $700 plus the contractor's fee. Virtually absolute protection from fallout is furnished by the double wall construction with 20 inches of earth between and the six inch concrete ceiling covered with 20 inches of gravel. Third, the pre-shaped metal shelter made from pre-shaped corrugated metal sections or pre-cast concrete can be constructed either underground or above ground. This shelter is also suitable for regions where rock or water are close to the surface. When covered with three feet of earth and given a protected entrance, it also will provide almost absolute protection. The cost, like the double wall shelter, is about $700 plus the fee of a contractor who probably would be needed to build it. Number four, the underground concrete shelter can be built by a contractor for about $1,000 to $1,500, depending upon the type of entrance used. Plans are designed so that it can have either a stairway entrance, such as is shown here, or with a hatchway entrance. The shelter can be built with a roof at ground level and mounded over with earth, or it can be built below ground level or into an embankment. Last, the concrete basement shelter is similar to the underground concrete shelter, except that it is designed as an added room to the basement, either in an existing home or one under construction. The shelter would add about $500 to the cost of a new home and would give excellent fallout protection. In construction of any one of these shelters, 
four essential features must be completed. The first is a proper entrance. It must have at least one right angle turn. Radiation travels in straight lines and only a fraction of it is scattered by the air or materials it strikes. So the sharp turn adds to the shielding. The second necessity is ventilation. This is provided in a concrete block basement shelter by vents in the wall and the open entrance. A blower may be installed for added comfort. For the other shelters, vent pipes and a blower is essential for proper ventilation. Good radio reception is the next essential. The shielding will cut it down. As soon as the shelter is completed, check the radio reception capabilities. It probably will be necessary to install an outside antenna to receive Conelrad broadcasts. Light is Dad's department. The Civil Defense Shelter booklet will show him how to fix a simple electrical system. This will furnish adequate low-level light if you have a spare battery. You will also want a flashlight or electric lantern for brighter light as needed. After your shelter is finished, you should stock it with the provisions and equipment you will need for a two-week stay. Since radiation outside may keep everyone inside, it is important that you have adequate supplies in your shelter. In choosing foods, place the emphasis on those which require no refrigeration and little cooking. Foods in cans or jars will stay in good condition six or more months if kept dry at a temperature between freezing and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Goods in paper boxes may be kept for six months if they are stored in tightly closed metal cans under the same dry, moderate temperatures. Be sure they are in a spot where rodents and insects won't attack them. Plan meals so there will be no leftovers, thus eliminating the problem of rapid spoilage. Meat, poultry, fish, vegetables, fruit, and many other items can be purchased in suitable quantities for such planning. It is a good practice to rotate canned foods at least once or twice a year. Exchange those in unprotected paper boxes at least every three months. Don't forget foods for infants, elderly persons, diabetics, or others who might require a special diet. Be sure that you choose foods which fit the preferences of your family. Civil defense officials have sample menus showing the quantity of food which should be set aside for each person for two weeks. Use this as your guide. Water will also be an important item. You will need a minimum of one half gallon per day per person. It should be stored in clean containers, preferably jugs, bottles, or jars with tight-fitting covers. Water in your hot water tank may also be used if it is close to the shelter. The container should be cleaned and refilled at least once every three months to keep the water palatable. Water purification tablets should be on hand to treat water which might contain harmful bacteria. For cooking and serving, you will want one or two pans, disposable tableware, paper plates, cups, and napkins. Don't forget a measuring cup, can opener, and matches. You will also want a small cooking unit, which will use a minimum of oxygen. A battery-powered radio is essential to provide communications with the outside world. Store extra batteries in a dry, cool place. Check the reception periodically to be sure you can receive Conelrad broadcasts. For cold weather, you will want lots of heavy clothing and warm bed clothes. In any weather, you will want some changes of clothing for all members of the family. A first aid kit will be very important. 
Your civil defense officials have a list of the basic first aid items you might need. You should also have a two-week supply of special medicines and equipment for the sick or chronically ill, such things as insulin and hypodermic needles for diabetics. If you have a baby, remember to include powdered formula, canned milk, bottles, nipples and disposable diapers, pins, talcum, and so on. Provide sanitation supplies such as cans with tight-fitting lids for human waste and garbage, and a receptacle which can be used as a toilet. Don't forget such things as towels, toilet tissue, sanitary napkins, and soap. A 5% DDT solution will protect you from insects. Remember how hard it is to keep the children entertained on a rainy day? Maintaining a high morale in your shelter area will be even more difficult because of cramped quarters and monotonous surroundings. Appropriate religious articles, books, games, and other amusements will help. You will also want miscellaneous equipment, such as a calendar, clock, and candles. A screwdriver, rubber gloves, and a shovel also may come in handy. More information on supplies and equipment, together with information on the approved fallout shelters, is contained in this booklet. Use it as your guide in planning and stocking your shelter. Now let's suppose for a moment that you can't get to a shelter in an emergency. What can you do to protect yourself? First, look for a basement. One below ground level will cut radiation to one-tenth of the level outside. The safest spot is in a corner which is least exposed to windows and deepest below the ground. If there is adequate warning, you can improve a basement's protection substantially by blocking the windows with bricks, dirt, books, magazines, or other heavy materials. If you are in a house with no basement, the best protection will be found on the ground floor in the central part of the house. The radiation there will be about half what it is outside. Large buildings such as apartment houses and office buildings afford excellent protection. With their thick walls and heavy floors, they provide almost as much shielding as the specially constructed concrete block shelter recommended for residences. If you have reason to believe you have fallout particles on your person or clothes, bathe thoroughly and leave the water outside the shelter. Outer garments also should be left outside and washed thoroughly before they are worn again. In washing exposed food or clothing, waterproof gloves should be worn. Fallout may be the primary threat which faces us in a national emergency, but keep in mind that it is a manageable threat. The right moves now will protect you and your loved ones later. You will need a good shelter and a two-week supply of food and water and other living essentials. If you have them ready and learn a few safety precautions, you and your family stand a first-rate chance of surviving any nuclear attack. Talk to your local or state civil defense officials immediately. They will give you detailed instructions on what you need to do. Then do it. Then you can rest assured that no matter what the fallout threat in the future, you and your family will be ready for it. You're watching Sleepcore, Pleasant Dreams.
You see, you don't get something for nothing in this life. The human condition is such that whatever we want has to be paid for with something else we want. And so the question is not, should you have safety? Should you have convenience? Should you have security? Of course you should. The question is, how much are you prepared to sacrifice of people's freedoms in order to get it? Because we also want freedom. I believe that in the future everybody will have a smart card. And this will not just be a card with money on it, it will have multi-use. There's no reason to, to, to think that you couldn't have one smart card that was your MasterCard, as well as your debit card, as well as your Mondex stored value card, as well as your welfare benefits card, as your health card, and your driver's license, and your student card, and your library card, uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, all of that information can be digitized and, um, and in fact, don't take up a lot of memory. And memory is cheap, so you could have one universal smart card and and uh, i'm sure people at companies like mondex are vying for that position in the marketplace to be to be the in the end the one dominant universal smart card So what I have here is the Mondex smart card with the microchip on the front of the card. Okay, right. This is where your purse is, where your value would be stored when you've moved money from your bank account onto your card. love to say nothing is inevitable so long as we're prepared to pay attention it's paying attention it's figuring out what questions to ask what properties of the medium to look at how it is that this is having its impact on us as individuals on us as households on us as whole cultures and societies on us as an overall planet the currency of the day is literally always what is most current. So at one time it was seashells, then it was metal, then it was paper, then it was plastic. Now what is most current today is information technology and bits and microchips. Modernity is a story of institutions becoming more and more distant from the people that they're supposed to serve and becoming more and more opaque so that you get the, this kind of Kafkaesque vision of the bureaucracy which is constantly deflecting you when you're trying to understand what's going on and how your life is being impinged upon by the actions of institutions, in particular the state, but not just the state. Uh, increasingly now it's business and corporations which are opaque. So the response then is not to make them less opaque, but rather to hire these people who will, will speak to us from those places. So we get, uh, we get PR people for corporations, we get spokespeople for governments, and they're our, our single conduit from this, the institution and to our own lives. Can we trust what they tell us? Of course we can, because we have no way of verifying it. There's no independent means of matching that against reality. That is the reality we get. That's all we get. Uh, so th this idea that the, uh, the spin doctor, right, the, the salesperson, uh, it's not just about consumer culture. I mean, we're, we're being sold things 24 hours a day in terms of products, but we know that. We're also being sold 
ideas were being sold our lives in various ways by these people who speak from institutions to us. When you do have a legitimate product or a service or you want to represent yourself, really what's required is, okay, then expose yourself. Tell people who you are and what you're doing and why you're doing it. Mondex has met with us, uh, CIBC and Royal Bank, and in that respect they've been talking to us and trying to get us to understand it and support it. But I think for generally for students, um, it's, it's an advertising campaign around the university and around wealth in general. I think we're seeing the confusion of the role of governance and the role of commerce. And in the world of commerce, you're, you're dealing with consumers. In the world of governance, you're dealing with citizens. I don't, I don't even really like using Interact just because I, I don't like banks. <laughs> I find that they, um, they're, they scam a lot and they take a lot of money that's unnecessary. <laughs> This method, this method of changing things when people don't really want change is taught in business schools as a method for taking over corporations. You take the corporation, you move in, and you change everything in 24 hours. You don't do it the first time first necessarily. You wait till you've got everything ready, and then you go, boom, you just change everything. The disorder is so great that it, you're the one who knows where you're going and what you're doing, and so you get what you want. It also allows me to track the last 10 transactions where I've spent money because that information is stored on the card. It's not stored any place else. And if you sign up for the program, you get most of the stuff for free. And so they've got to make their money somewhere. I think it's going to be about um, selling the information because if they can actually break down to how much I actually spend on my on entertainment, that becomes that much more valuable to somebody else. If you read a recent issue of Marketing News, for example, you'll see that merchants like smart cards. Why? Because they act as tracking devices. It's precisely because of the tracking device aspect that is, that the marketer can follow the trail, the footprints that you leave every time you make a purchase or a phone call or whatever it is. The fact that they can follow it is very attractive because it means they can build up a personal profile on you, the customer. Names and addresses have a huge, huge market value these days. People often say, it's only my name and address, what's the big deal? Your name and address fuels a multi-billion dollar direct marketing industry. It's the raw material for uh, a seventy-five dollar, a seventy-five billion dollar industry in the United States and eleven billion dollar a year business in Canada. So names and addresses and personal information have great market value. Certainly, databases are not autonomous. Every time data is collected on a big system, that system costs an awful lot of money to put into place. It's technically very, very sophisticated and uh, very expensive, and it has very specific purposes, whether it's set up for uh, to try to track welfare fraud or to uh, track consumer profiles. All of this technology has made the collection, uh, manipulation, and, and trafficking in personal information much easier and much more profitable and therefore much more attractive to business. Uh, the individual who provides this information, that's you and me and all the millions of us, have almost nothing to say about what happened to us thereafter. The issue of database sharing or database matching and warehousing is the coming battleground for privacy protection, uh, both in the public and the private sector. There are enormous quantities of highly sensitive and intimate personal information about all of us now contained in data banks all over the place. And with the growth of the internet and network communications, you're not going to have any ability to access that information and try to correct it if it's incorrect. And that's a huge problem. The corporation has an economic interest and, in fact, a duty to their shareholders, we should recognize, to exploit the system as, as much as they can financially. And so if transaction records of people's purchases has value, 
and Wondex is legally allowed to sell it, they should sell it. And if they don't sell it, they're being negligent to their shareholders. So we have the wallet reading card one or card two. You see, so often what happens, these things become something like the sorcerer's apprentice. We create the instrument. There's a legitimate reason for it, but the instrument goes on and becomes a monster in its own right. And largely because we didn't create the safeguards at the time, we weren't we didn't address ourselves, we didn't ask the hard questions, we just looked at the convenience, the administrative convenience, or whatever other legitimate objective had to be resolved, but we didn't face the price that may have to be paid. Essentially, we are on, on the cusp of the issue. We are at the point where the technologies are now available to collect uh, the most intimate details of our, uh, our medical background, our genetic makeup. Um, we are um, at the point at which governments and the private sector have tools like smart cards, like data ware building data warehouses, which can assemble all of this material. But we do not have the policies, the legislation, the understandings um, that will allow us to maintain control over that. And it's like time bombs waiting to go off. And you know, we will you know, find ourselves down the line have, waking up, I think, to the fact that we have lost a great deal of the control of, of, of information. In Swindon, uh, you, in, in the UK, uh, Mondex had a, a, a test run similar to what they're doing now in Guelph, Ontario. Um, and uh, a group uh, like ours called Privacy International uh, was concerned about whether the, the Mondex technology was truly anonymous, which is how Mondex was describing it at the time. It was anonymous just like hash. Um, and they filed uh, in court um, uh, an action claiming that Mondex was, was guilty of false advertising. Um, and in the end, Mondex had to admit that in fact their system wasn't anonymous and they withdrew the, the word anonymous from all of their public relations. And if you look carefully at the the material that Mondex is distributing describing their, their test run in Guelph, you won't find the word anonymous. You are literally defenseless when it comes to your privacy in the private sector, in the commercial sector. There are almost no laws, except in Quebec, which cover what they do with your information. So you uh, and I and every all the rest of us are going naked before the world, believe me. The question comes to mind is, do we have the time or care to make those decisions? Those are difficult decisions that involve taking responsibility. And I think most of us feel so poorly informed, uh, so, so, so poorly have access to such little information that we just decide, I, I don't know. You know I, I don't know the truth anymore. And I just prefer, uh, I prefer for someone else to make those decisions for me. If we as citizens sit back and let things just take their course, sit back and let those who would profit from these machines without any concern for those they may hurt or displace in the process. If we sit back and just let bureaucrats in Ottawa or anywhere else in this country simply make the decisions, we're kidding ourselves about what kind of society and future we're going to end up with. The cashless society is a conflict between our desire for efficiency and our fear of outside control. So we like the idea of, of the cash card, now we like the idea of, of Interact because it means it's more convenient for us to acquire goods in various ways. You know, we go and have our consumer transactions and they're made smoother, they're made less frictionful. Uh, but at the same time, we have this nightmare vision, which is apocalyptic, of some external force controlling us in, in a way by seizing our assets. So the, the scenario from Margaret Atwood's novel
You're watching Sleepcore. Sleep tight. For a greater knowledge of the world you live in, Wolf and Dessauer in downtown Fort Wayne and downtown Huntington brings the Screen News Digest, a chapter of living history, into your classroom. Canaveral, August 1962, the beginning, the beginning of a distant journey for Mariner 2, thrust into the heavens by a mighty Atlas Agena rocket. His work done, the Atlas drops away, and Mariner 2 starts on its way to a celestial rendezvous with the planet Venus, 36 million miles away. 115 miles above the Earth, Mariner 2 parks in space for 15 minutes. Then the Agena rocket comes alive and the space vehicle is given a final push at 27,500 miles an hour. Thirty minutes after launch, Mariner 2 is on its own, an instrument-crammed messenger in space. As it tumbles through the heavens, it spreads its solar panels, the wings covered with sunshine batteries, which power the scientific equipment aboard. For 110 days, Mariner 2 speaks from space in a jumble of shrill sounds that are stored, translated, and studied as scientists probe the far frontiers of the cosmic unknown. Listen now to the actual sound of Mariner 2. The fly past of Venus, scheduled for mid-December 1962, can provide the first scientific close-up of the bright planet that has been called the Earth's twin. When and if the mission is accomplished, it will be the greatest distance from which meaningful scientific information has been radioed back to Earth, and it will mark the first successful planetary flight ever carried out by man. In the field of piloted space flight, America unveils the Dinosaur, a revolutionary one-man glider scheduled for launching in 1965. A series of boosters with a thrust of two and a half million pounds are required to put the 10-ton Dinosaur into a 100-mile high orbit. The final booster is jettisoned as the space glider circles the Earth at 17,000 miles an hour. The pilot can change orbit and even head for the moon. On re-entry, the cockpit shield falls away and the astronaut, using his upturned wingtips as rudders, guides the glider to a perfect three-point landing. Most revolutionary, most advanced of all American spacecraft is the Apollo the vehicle that will attempt to put this country's first men on the moon. Almost nine million pounds of thrust will be needed to propel the mother ship and the lunar landing capsule, now changing position in mid-flight, on their quarter of a million mile journey. Three men will ride the mother ship, called the command capsule, and at a speed of 18,000 miles an hour, the distance between the Earth and the Moon can be covered in some 15 hours. On reaching the Moon, the spacecraft goes into a 100-mile-high orbit. Two men will make the landing, while the third astronaut remains in the command capsule. The trailblazing descent to the moon is made by a combination of manual control and automatic systems. The 
lunar capsule will be able to maneuver much like a helicopter. It will hover in a fixed position if necessary, and it will move left or right so that the crew can select the exact point of landing. Once landed, before any other action, the men will prepare all systems for takeoff. Once this has been done, the great adventure can begin. The lunar pioneers will be instructed by the third member in the mother ship and by information transmitted from Earth. Photographs and samples of the moon's surface will be obtained. And apparatus for the continued transmission of scientific data back to Earth will be left behind. The two men will fire the launching engine at a precisely determined instant to make certain capsule and mother ship meet in lunar orbit. If all goes well, the two vehicles will dock in space and the moon explorers will transfer back into the command capsule. The smaller capsule will probably be left in orbit around the moon to save weight on the return trip. Following a mid-course correction and just before entering the Earth's atmosphere, the astronaut's capsule with the three men inside will separate from the command spacecraft and swing into its re-entry attitude. As the capsule streaks through the atmosphere, its heat shield turns fiery red then white hot. At 50,000 feet, a small parachute helps break the descent. Then three giant parachutes open, and much like the Project Mercury recovery, gently lower the capsule back to Earth, probably on land rather than sea, ending the dream of the centuries come true, a journey to the moon.
discovered a dynamic and evolving planet with unexpected geological features. A volcanic mountain, many times larger than the largest volcano on Earth. A vast and deep canyon extending for 2,500 miles. And dry, river-like channels that may have been carved by running water. Beyond the orbit of Mars is the belt of asteroids, craggy chunks of rock and metal, some as small as boulders, others hundreds of miles in diameter. About 500 million miles from the sun, we encounter the first of the giant gas planets, Jupiter, the colossus of the solar system more massive than all the other planets combined. Deep beneath the maelstrom of clouds that band its surface is a primordial atmosphere much like that in which life awakened on Earth millions of years ago. And drifting on its surface is the mysterious red spot an immense cyclonic storm that has raged for hundreds of years and continues unabated. Radiating more energy than it receives from the sun and circled by 14 moons, Jupiter is like a miniature solar system. The next largest of the gas planets is Saturn girded by rings which, as we approach them, resolve into countless particles of frozen debris and ice, each a tiny moon orbiting the massive planet. And as we continue past the frozen worlds of Uranus and Neptune, we arrive at the outermost planet in the solar system, Pluto. It moves in a dim twilight of unimaginable cold. The sun, four billion miles away, has only a brilliant light in the night sky. To travel beyond the solar system to the nearest star would require a journey of more than five trillion miles. Yet our sun is only one of a hundred billion stars widely separated from one another in time and space, but all bound by gravity, and all revolving around the central core of our galaxy, the Milky Way. Drifting between the stars are vast clouds of gas and dust, the nebulae, made luminous by the radiation of stars within or near them. or darkly obscuring the light of whatever lies behind them. Here, new stars are being born. About a half century ago, our galaxy was thought to be alone in the universe. We now know it to be one of a local group of about 20 galaxies. And strewn through the vast reaches of space are more than 10 billion galaxies, grouped in clusters as far as our most sensitive instruments can reach. Little is known about the evolution of galaxies and why some are formless or irregular, others elliptical, and still others spiral shaped. And we know as little about the galactic core and its role in the galaxy's evolution and structure. The problem has become more perplexing by the discovery that some galaxies are in a state of extreme disarray, exploding, ejecting gaseous matter, or interacting with other galaxies. Even more puzzling are quasars, star-like objects, emitting as much energy every second as the sun radiates in some 10 million years. They appear to be among the most remote objects in space.
Stars are born, live out their lifespans, and die. The life history of a star is marked by an opposition of two kinds of pressure. One is the pressure created by the energy in the core of the star, pushing the surface outward. The other is the crushing force of gravity pulling the star's surface inward. When these are balanced, a star becomes stable and shines steadily. As hydrogen fuel is depleted, the release of energy is insufficient to withstand the gravitational pressure, and the core collapses. But compression by gravity raises the temperature in the core, and helium ash rekindles the nuclear fires. Vast amounts of energy are released and lift the outer zones against the force of gravity. The star is now a red giant. In the final stage of its evolution, it is the mass of a star that determines its fate. The sun, a medium-sized star, remains stable for approximately 10 billion years. Then it will expand to 400 times its present diameter. As it expands, it will engulf the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and create a nebula extending past the outer planets. After millions of years, its reserves of nuclear fuel will be exhausted. Its outer layers will have dissipated, and only a white dwarf star remains, no larger than the Earth. Slowly cooling to zero temperature, it will end its life as a black stellar corpse. When a star more massive than the sun reaches the red giant stage, the collapse of its core raises its temperature billions of degrees and triggers a spectacular detonation. A supernova explosion. At the center of the explosion, a residue of the star is crushed by gravity to a neutron core only a few miles across, but so dense that 10 billion tons of its matter would fill only a tablespoon. It spins rapidly, generating radio signals in its strong magnetic field. And a radiation beam sweeping past the Earth is observed as a pulse. The star is known as a pulsar. An even stranger end is predicted for very massive stars. According to the laws of gravity as presently understood, nothing can stop its collapse. The star disappears from our universe, leaving a black hole in space. Its presence can be deduced only by its influence on a visible companion star, distorted out of shape by the black hole's gravitational attraction. Gas, pulled off the visible star, circulates about the black hole and in the dizzying plunge, it emits X-rays which can be detected in space. No light or matter can ever leave the intense gravitational field of this cosmic abyss. The physical laws that govern the conditions within this bizarre object are totally unknown to us. The evolving universe itself must come to an end. If it continues to expand indefinitely, the light of every star will in time be extinguished, and the galaxies will disappear into infinite darkness. But if gravity halts the expansion, the universe will fall back on itself. Galaxies will lose their separate identities. Stars will explode and the sky will again be ablaze with light. Finally, all matter will be engulfed in a fireball like that from which it emerged.
all things on earth, living and inert, are formed from the elements forged in some distant and unknown star. On earth, atoms joined together in definite numbers and patterns compose the organic molecules which form living cells. Since the discovery of complex molecules in the chilled vacuum of interstellar space, there is reason to believe that among the countless galaxies in the universe, there are stars orbited by planets favorable for the evolution of intelligent life. Is space travel to these planets possible? Time and distance may be insurmountable barriers. The spacecraft Pioneer, now speeding toward the outer planets and beyond, traveling at 35,000 miles an hour, would take almost 80,000 years to reach the nearest star, Alpha Centauri. A spacecraft traveling 2,500 times faster than Pioneer at 10% the speed of light would require so great an expenditure of energy that until new sources have been tapped, it must remain an invention of science fiction. A more practical strategy in the search for extraterrestrial life is to tune in on radio signals traveling at the speed of light, beamed perhaps by creatures on the planet of some distant star. Someday, an array of telescopes, earthbound or lifted to the far side of the moon, may hear faint but unmistakably meaningful sounds amidst the din of cosmic radio chatter. That moment will signal a change in the human condition that we cannot foresee or imagine. For man, wrote H.G. Wells, there is no rest and no ending. He must go on, conquest beyond conquest. And when he has conquered all the deeps of space and all the mysteries of time, still, he will be beginning. You're watching Sleepcore. Sleep tight. All windows glitter like gold in the glint of the rising summer sun. And for those who have the imagination to see them that way, the gold seems almost real enough to touch and gather up and coin it. But to make it real and really to gather in the gold takes a different kind of touch. It does take a touch of imagination, of course, but it also calls for a powerful touch, the touch of a powerful name, a touch of genius with which to kindle the public's own imagination to give velocity to the sale of one's products out in the marketplace, where the gold from golden windows is gathered into heaps by those who can and will. There is no need to tell you gatherers of gold that the Westinghouse room air conditioners you have sold so successfully go back to that day when the smallest yet most powerful compressor for its size powered the biggest breakthrough in the history of the room air conditioner business. The price was right, the timing was perfect, and Westinghouse, the people who captured the compact market, got into the air conditioning business with you in the biggest way, and stayed in it, and grew ahead of the market's rate of growth to its rightful place among the leaders. The velocity is there. The velocity of sales, the capacity and completeness of the line are there. We're already there in 1965. The finest line of room air conditioners in Westinghouse or anyone else's history. Don't touch it, you may have said, if only to yourselves. It's going beautifully. 
Don't touch those compacts. In five short years, Westinghouse has risen to within reach of the leadership of the market, second to one, able now to become second to none. Nobody's ever made such a reliable air conditioner before. They're the undisputed leaders far and away. They're truly portable. Don't touch them. Don't touch that line. We can put it into first place exactly as it is. You may have said or thought that. But what if we were to say to you, the people who captured the compact market have done it all over again. Suppose we were to say to you, there is a segment of the market, a segment almost so big as to comprise a market in and of itself, which no one has really touched to this day to turn it into gold. There is a window which stands untouched in the marketplace. It represents more than a third, nearly the half, of three million aluminum windows being sold each year in this country. It is the sliding window, and it stands virtually untouched in the marketplace for air conditioners today. May we touch it? 5,500 BTUs. 8,000 BTUs. Designed for the purpose it serves, and it serves it with consummate ease. May we touch it again? More gold. It fits a casement window just as well, superbly. The people who captured the compact market have done it all over again. The sliding window is now your market to have and to hold. Touch it, and it turns to gold. There is another window, and it stands in the living room waiting. A living room window is not a place for machinery. Don't touch it, its mistress may have said. And yet neither is the living room or the dining room a place for sweltering heat. May we touch it? Panel Air, a new decorator touch air conditioner for those rooms in which machinery does not belong. When you aren't using it, it practically isn't there. But when you are using it, it is there to the tune of 8,700, 10,200, or 15,000 BTUs. And when you want to shut it off again, it's gone. The shadow box framing of the Westinghouse panel air conditioner makes it seem smaller than it is. That's the decorator touch, integral with the unit itself. May we touch it again? Match the wallpaper, paste it on. Match the paint, paint it on. The living room, the dining room, the decorated room window. Touch it with a panel air by Westinghouse, and the gold is yours. There's an air conditioner, a brute of an air conditioner. Unbelievably powerful, unbelievably quiet. Some of you said those were its only weaknesses as a producer of gold. It was unbelievable. It lacked the rugged look. Some people found it difficult to believe that the Southerner could pack more than two tons of power in its refined and delicate-looking cabinet. Change it, some of you said. We can't sell it when it looks too dainty to do a man's job. Don't touch it, some of you said. We need that furniture look to make it sell. So we didn't touch it. We left it in the line. But we added a touch. We gave that ladylike Southerner a tough-looking brother. They'll believe this one, the Westinghouse Super Heavy Duty, with a look that goes with the power it packs. 12, 18, 20, reversible or not, 23, 5, 26,000 BTUs. The same quiet marvel as the Southerner, now with the rugged look, Super Heavy Duty. Touch a window with this one, and much gold is yours. There is a window that stands untouched in many homes because the family that would buy a room air conditioner will not pay to have it installed and cannot install it. Stalemate. Many such windows have been touched and turned to gold with the Westinghouse mobile frame. But don't touch it. Oh, let us touch that frame just once for 1966. There, good as gold. What it did as an integral part of the compacts, it will do as a mobile frame for the mobile airs, 16 or 22 inch. Exciting new Mylar wing and all. How simple. Now you can touch it. Touch it to the hands of those who wish to install their own, and they'll hand you the gold themselves. Three compacts, 
Mobile Air 5000, Deluxe Mobile Air 5000, and Custom Mobile Air 6000. The biggest news since the people at Westinghouse captured the compact market. The exciting new sliding window unit, which not only fits them to perfection, but fits casement windows as well, superbly. Comes in two sizes, 5,500 and 8,000. There are 12 models in all to serve the middle market. Among them, three 16-inch Deluxe Mobile Airs, 6,000, 8,200, and 9,300 BTUs, and four high-capacity Mobile Airs from 10,200 to 17,000 BTUs. One of them has a particular magic about it. You knew it as a model that would remove 11,700 BTUs of heat per hour from a room. It would not have been honest to call it a one-ton air conditioner, because a one-ton unit must remove 12,000 BTUs per hour. And yet there are many buyers and prospects who will talk, and want to be talked to, in terms of tons. So we touched it. We beefed up the capacity, enlarged the evaporator, and now this high-capacity air conditioner in the middle of the line does remove 12,000 BTUs per hour. And you may use the magic words, one ton, at will. Use them on those who want them used, and they'll turn to golden words for you. And for the southern market, there are four reverse cycle heat and cool models, and two electric heat models ranging from 8,700 to 20,000 BTUs. Three capacities for the stunning new decorator touch panel air, the one that isn't there until you want it. And to top the line, the super heavy duty with the rugged look is available in five cooling models and a 20,000 BTU reverse heat and cool unit. Along with its sister, the Southerner. A five model line, just as powerful, twice as dainty. The finest line of room air conditioners in Westinghouse or anyone else's history. The Westinghouse line of room air conditioners for 1966. Don't touch that line. We wouldn't think of touching it, other than here and there. There is no need to tell you gatherers of gold how to sell room air conditioners. You have already shown us that you have that golden touch. What we have done has been simply to provide you with the means. Use them well. Touch the right windows and the right people with them at the right time and in the right way. The ways you already know. And watch those windows turn to gold for you. New towels and linens too. And that's why your kitchen has a combination clothes washer and dryer that can do your prettiest and filmiest party dresses no matter how dirty you get them. But what you like to do best is when you push all the buttons real fast and everything goes back where it was and nobody would know that you've been there looking at everything and imagining it's your kitchen and your home someday, maybe. A few thousand tomorrow is farther into your future. You know, there's something you've noticed about grown-ups. They're so often tired and tense somehow. And when your parents get that way, you're pretty glad they have a place to go and rest and relax. They call it their relaxation center. It has lots of real fun things. There's a closet you can see into to clean suits and dresses just as clean and wrinkle-free as new. There's a shower with an air curtain and a steam bath. And a tub with a water circulator. That's very relaxing and healthy too, your father says. And when you're older, you want to have a vanity just like mother's with lights and mirrors and even a hot air supply that can dry your hair or run a nail polisher or toothbrush or daddy's automatic shaver. And there's a comfort lounge, just the best place for you or mother to read or get a suntan or watch television.
that's also where grown-ups sometimes take a nap, covered by a blanket that's either warm or cool, as you wish. Of course, you almost never nap in the day. You're too old for that. But it's fun to lie there, daydreaming, imagining that you're grown up. Just imagine. Visiona ist eine Möglichkeit für mobileres Wohnen, eine Herausforderung, ein realisiertes Denkmodell. Im gemieteten Raum richtet sich der Bewohner ein. Er baut sich seine Wohnung mit den Artikeln, die er auf dem Markt findet. Nach diesem Muster, das sich Visiona nennt, könnte der Mieter der einst vollständig integrierte Aggregate kaufen, wie Badezelle, Schlafeinheit, Unterhaltungscenter und Kücheneinheit, alle in verschiedenen Ausführungen, größere und kleinere, mehr oder weniger luxuriöse. In der vollautomatisierten Küchenzelle sind sämtliche Küchengeräte von einem Schaltpult aus bedienbar. Zahlreiche Schaltuhren, Summer und Blinker sollen die Überwachung der Vorgänge ermöglichen, selbst wenn sich die Hausfrau außerhalb der Küche befindet. Ja, da hätte jetzt aber einer versucht auszubrechen aus dem System. Der Chocolombo, der hat sich überlegt, er will aus dem Essplatz und der Küche ein einziges Möbel machen. Ja, und wem ist denn das Möbel? Ja, das gehört dem Mieter. Wenn er eine Wohnung mietet, dann schiebt er das in den Rohbau rein. Ja, wir können sich auch vorstellen, dass es dem Hausbesitzer gehört. Und dann müsste der Mieter nur noch mit der Koffer zügeln. Auch die Visiona möchte als Möglichkeit, als Denkmodell in Frage gestellt werden. In dem Kasten hat es ja keinen Platz. Was machen wir da? Ja, das ist das gleiche Problem wie in der Küche. Was macht man, wenn man einen neuen Eiskasten braucht? Oder eine größere Abwaschmaschine? Ja, dann verkauft man es halt und kauft ein größeres Modell. Beim Auto muss man schließlich den Kofferraum auch nicht anbauen oder mehr Platz einbauen. Oder man wirft den ganzen Block weg. Das ist ja schließlich aus Kunststoff. More 
than meets the eye. This presentation case is about to start on a mission to tell a story of the sounds that all America hears and heeds. react to sound from early childhood. All day long, all through life, sounds are our most common cues for action. Sound follows us around wherever we go. We hear up, down, and all around us. We hear globally. We see only into the wedge of space before our eyes. The influence of sound is very deep in language. For example, if you overlook something, you miss it. But if you overhear something, you don't miss it. Radio, like sound, is all around us. It's the most far-reaching medium for listening, the most versatile entertainer, the greatest salesman. Radio is the only advertising medium that doesn't tie you down. It's upstairs, downstairs, in the kitchen, in the car, beside beach chair and hammock. Research people tell us that less than half of all radio listening is in the living room. More than a third is in the kitchen, 12% in bedrooms, and the rest in dining rooms and dens, automobiles and public places. Radio not only goes everywhere, it comes from everywhere. This is George Kremen in Tokyo. The big story in this part of the world today is in the Paris Square. And that's the news as it looks from Paris. This is David Schoenbrunn returning you now to New York. Wherever radio goes in time or place, the listener's mind is its own theater. It creates its own colorful costumes and sets, the perfect gown for Scarlett O'Hara, the brooding castle of Wuthering Heights, the sunny schoolroom of our Miss Brooks, each perfect for each listener. In radio, the listener's imagination also serves the advertiser. For through radio, a prospect pictures a product in terms of his own needs, his own likes and dislikes. The listener easily creates the image desirable for him. What a perfectly beautiful house. In radio, the most beautiful house is always one's own most beautiful house. You're the most beautiful girl in the world. Each to his own fancy, and no arbitrary model is ever more captivating. Mmm, good. The most delicious soup for every taste. For muscular aches and pains, get soothing relief. For Junior's lame shoulder, father's stiff neck, mother's aching back. By painting pictures in people's minds, radio wins response. And it wins response through the authority of the unseen voice. For radio is the sum of many voices, a compelling force in people's lives. We interrupt this program to take you to the Pentagon in Washington for a special bulletin. The Defense Department has just issued the first list of prisoners of war held by the communists in Korea. 
Here are the names. George Malkin, private first class, Muncie, Indiana. Wife, Mrs. Virginia Malkin. Samuel R. Bartok, private first class, Austin, Texas. Mother, Mrs. Sarah Mary. Shalkoff. Is that right, Sarah Shalkoff? Yeah. Mrs. Shalkoff, tell us what you saw. I have lived in Elizabeth, New Jersey, 15 years. Always the planes coming over. I'm afraid. Well, where were you when the plane crashed? I was calling out the window my daughter to suffer. I saw it hit, and then was fire. It was terrible. Is this your daughter? Yes. Oh, thank God my baby's right, safe. Watch out, dear. Watch out, ambulance. Thank you, madam. Let's move up and talk to one of the firemen. Radio listeners have heard history and history in the making through 30 eventful years. And in the business of daily living, they tell each other, the radio says it's going to rain, or the radio says it's 10 past 9, or the radio says wheat prices went up today. The radio says it, and that's a fact. The power of radio to win belief works in the service of the advertiser, for people believe before they buy. Nor is radio's influence limited to one particular market, to families of a certain income group, or place, or occupation. Radio's coverage is greater than the coverage of any other mass medium. It speaks through 105 million radio sets to people in 43 million homes, in 23 million automobiles, and within hearing of 5 million sets in public places. Radio goes wherever there are people, even within the home, radio is always close by, through 34 million sets outside the living room. People want radio to reach out to them. They keep on buying new radios. Last year, they bought the astonishing total of 10 million new sets, twice as many as refrigerators or television sets or washing machines. Radio reaches out and captures the interest of virtually every family in the land. And in 1952, more people are spending more time with radio than with any other medium. More than 14 million people listen in the middle of the morning, 14 million in the afternoon, 25 million at night. And these totals are conservative, for national rating services regularly measure only about half of all radio sets. But even on this basis, radio reaches prospects at the lowest cost per thousand rate in all advertising, lower than television, newspapers, or magazines. In radio, a whole nation of listeners votes as an academy of... of our new advertising campaign. Memo to President from Advertising Director. This, this is, is to bring you up, you up to date, date on our, our new media plans. Once again, and after fresh examination, network radio seems to give us the best combination of coverage, low cost, and effectiveness. We need these more than ever because of the brand versus price problem we've discussed many times. Shoppers all over the country today are taking a sharp look at prices. If advertising fails to make one brand more appealing than another, the shopper buys by price. In fact, a brand in a market that advertising doesn't reach is no brand at all. As someone put it the other day, a brand is really a state of mind. Advertising creates this state of mind, turns a product into a brand, makes it come alive at the shopper's fingertips. Only then do shoppers buy by brand and not by price. If we want to keep our brand alive everywhere, we need to reach everybody at a low enough cost to reach them over and over again. Radio still offers the best chance to do this. Radio has kept its rates down, while hardly a week goes by that we don't hear of increases from other media. Just now, I'm collecting latest information on each of the networks. But my overall feeling favors radio, because radio gets our product bought by brand in all markets and builds consumer preference and dealer support everywhere. Early next week, I hope to be able to...
Now, in radio, a whole nation of listeners votes as an Academy of Awards. And there's little question which network has the Oscar. CBS Radio has more top programs, daytime or nighttime, than all other networks combined. In report after report, the industry's top 29 summary gives CBS Radio some 20 of the biggest audience shows on the air. The appeal of this program schedule attracts one-third of all network listening in big cities, in small towns, and all across the nation's farmlands. Also, the average audience is bigger on CBS Radio. It's not just that the top programs pull up the average, it's because any program gets a lift as part of CBS Radio's complete lineup. The result is low cost. CBS Radio has the lowest cost per thousand listeners in all network radio. And CBS Radio's cost has stayed low, far lower than magazines, newspapers, or television, lower than almost any commodity you can name. Here for nighttime programs is CBS Radio's cost per thousand trend for the past eight years, compared with the rising U.S. wholesale price index. In contrast, Last year, the cost of reaching a thousand people through leading magazines increased as much as 35 percent. Low cost permits advertising frequency, and the changing character of consumer shopping today makes frequency indispensable. You need frequency to pre-sell the 80 million shoppers who go to self-service stores every week. It's frequency that makes the multiple impressions that make sales. All the leadership values of CBS Radio in programs, coverage, and economy are acknowledged by American business. For advertisers invest more dollars to build sales on CBS Radio than on any other network. P.S. I've just finished taking a fresh look at the various networks and I'd particularly like you to hear the CBS radio story. And so, in the parade of network values, the top programs lead to the biggest audiences, to the lowest costs, to the biggest values in all advertising on the CBS radio network. suburbs, almost as much written about as Madison Avenue, and just as much in need of reflection. Like Madison Avenue, life in the suburbs has its good moments, and others not so good. Discouraged? Disgruntled? Heck no. They're glad to be here. Remember? they join the stream of family life in the suburbs, soon to become part of its familiar sights, soon to absorb its familiar sounds.
but wherever they go, there's usually a baby nearby. And about the time the parents think their children have them hypnotized, they give a party and bring the kids. magazine written for young adults and matching their busy lives is bound to be lively, full of things to talk about, varied and warm. not to miss a single new homemaking idea. They're busy just making choices and welcome solid information in concise form. It takes a while for a young couple to realize all they're in for when they buy a house or when they have a baby. And when they buy a house and have a baby, so hardly realizing it, they come into their purchasing stage and are off on a wild non-stop ride. It's a happy-go-spending world, reflected in the windows of the suburban shopping centers where they go to buy. Red Book has been studying shopping centers because the people who created the suburbs are young adults. And the shopping centers are built in their image. Selling to young adults demands a new kind of marketing. For these young adults, the shopping centers have built fountains, commissioned statues, put in restaurants and freestanding stairways. They've included banks, loan offices, rental plans, plant nurseries, and places to buy building materials. The shopping centers see these young adults as people whose homes are always in need of expansion. 
People who buy in large quantities and truck it away in their cars. It's a big market. To help people find their cars, the centers have enlisted the children. They've put in shopmobiles to help them cover the ground. They've added banks of storage lockers, miles of checkout counters, and endless rows of carts. Carts rolling down the malls at Southdale, at Northland, at Gulfgate, Sunrise, and East Point, at Hillsdale in California. These young adults shopping with the same determination that led them to the suburbs in the first place are the goingest part of a nation on wheels. Living by the automobile, the first young adults in the age of the push button. Like the rest of life in suburbia, shopping has a family flavor. Do you remember what size she was? Five. I think we bought a tree to go with. Yes, yeah, sir. That looks pretty nice. I don't know. Shall I take it? These busy families make the shopping centers look young and colorful. They have a let's go see quality that brings crowds to community events and promotions. Since these young adults seem to be able to outlast their children, they stash them away at a neighbor's house and go back to the center for more. This is the life young adults lead, summed up recently in a single phrase, and dramatized by Red Book in major shopping centers all over the country. For more than two years, Red Book had been working with merchants associations in shopping centers, studying young adults. When the Easy Living promotion was presented, Almost every store joined in. The first center-wide promotion in the history of marketing. Before Red Book could develop a successful selling program for young adults, it had to get out and see them many different ways. It had to get to know them so well that it could become a magazine solely for them. What are young adults like from an editor's point of view? Well, they're not so much high brows or low brows as wrinkled brows. They're serious. Writing for young adults, Red Book's editors have to keep learning and analyzing. Without too much crystal ball gazing, Red Book's editors have to keep an eye to the future. There is a whole new generation coming, soon to be young adults. A bigger than ever market of people who have a history of their own who remember all the way back to Eisenhower, who probably never saw their mother use a ringer, think automobiles or household appliances, and have reserved seats on the next rocket to leave the Earth. Right now.
now, you can ride along with the happy ghost spending. Buy it now, young adults of today. Ride with the young adults who are buying 70% of all homes sold. Swing into the orbit of more than two and a half million families. Right now, with the only mass magazine aimed exclusively at young adults. You're watching Sleepcore, Pleasant Dreams. some pretty mixed up ones too. Easy living. It's always been just around the corner. future we sure do the only difference is that today with what we know and what we're learning to do we really can bring our dreams to life a living tribute to our richest resource people here's a new kind of cityscape the microprocessor an entire computer on a tiny silicon chip crystals Inspired by nature, now engineered by man for an ever-growing role in microelectronics. The world of liquid space, oceans of minerals and food ready to fuel tomorrow's needs. The DNA chain, life's molecular blueprint. Decoding its secrets is leading us to dramatically improved health. The sun. Today we're learning ways to harness its limitless energy. Agricultural engineer is a little more like it. Okay, but me, I'll take the city. Yes, it's always exciting. But hey, with today's transportation, we're just minutes away from our kids. Look 
at that, will you? A few years ago, this was all barren desert. No crops, no irrigation. Quite a transformation. Harvest at 10. Finish picking the North Quadrant, then recycle for cultivation. I just wanted to let you know the weather guys are calling for showers out of the north. Well, I'm not surprised. I can see the storm from here. Even the robots see it. Stand by, harvesters. I need real showers. I believe it. Thanks for the warning. All harvesters, suspend the irrigation program. my speed sports and exercise in zero gravity it looks like fun it is once you get the hang of it Oh, 
The cheapest and the quickest way of making money. Dig a little deeper. Jerry Palace. Well, we may as well follow him to see where the hell he goes. Jerry runs the Checkermate agency with his partner Tim Bartlett. These Foster really does need to dip his left shoulder to the left. And... Ray Murray. Welcome aboard the Carnival Cruise Line's fun... I'm delighted the forecast in the Sterren for Tom. Eerst wou ik even... Recording his new album, Ten Summoner's Tales, in a Det gör någon trend, men intressant är... Surprise for you today. Yes. Guess who I've got online to... Alors cela, oui. je vais y acheter le persil dessus. Photographs highlight differences in the... Every day, Euros... Grand Scotch whisky. January and February. gratificazione personale i giorni che io ero in questo nuovo ufficio e comunque dovevo rimanere lì Les yeux bleus de ces deux filles incroyables.
Hier haben Sie.